Welcome to the Dr. Gundry Podcast. You know, it's been referred to as the mother of all antioxidants, the master detoxifier and the maestro of the immune system. I'm talking about glutathione, one of the most essential molecules for helping the body fight off illness and prevent premature aging. In fact, it's been shown that many people who suffer from serious health conditions lack a lot of glutathione in the body. And unfortunately, due to poor diet and the abundance of toxins in our environment, the majority of us are also running low on glutathione. But my guest today is here to help. After a quick break, I'll introduce you to Dr. Steve Morris, a physician and chief formulation scientist who specializes in developing nutraceuticals and cosmetic formulations. Dr. Morris has a passion for discovering alternative ways to promote well-being, and when it comes to supporting your glutathione levels, he says he's cracked the code. In a bit, we'll dive into Dr. Morris's research on some of the most incredible ways to support your health so that you feel and even look like a younger, healthier you. So, Dr. Morris, it's great to have you on the podcast. So, first of all, for everybody who's wants to know what the heck is glutathione and why do we need it? I know that's a big one, uh, but let's start there. No, that's a great question. Um, I think I think to start off, we, we probably need to back up just a little bit and talk about, you know, what the heck is a free radical? You know, we hear that word all the time. Um, we hear that we're constantly exposed to them, and we are, both inside our bodies and outside. Um, and, and the main thing to know is that free radicals and toxins are basically just unstable molecules looking for stability. Um, glutathione, as you mentioned, is the maestro or master antioxidant um, in, in the body. Um, it neutralizes or renders inert those uh, free radicals and toxins um, at a very efficient rate. Um, and... Uh, that's its main role in the body. So uh, I've, I've written in the energy paradox and elsewhere that uh, glutathione is really the master antioxidant within mitochondria, the energy producing organelles in most of our cells. Yeah. Um, so, what's, so what's the difference between so an antioxidant that we use that term rather freely. Yes, we um, do. And, and, and glutathione. Glutathione is a true antioxidant, true? Yes, it's, it's called an, an endogenous um, antioxidant, meaning it's made inside our body. So in essence, uh, the best antioxidant that we have, our bodies make. Um, we just need to give it the right building block, so to speak, and we're going to talk about that. To, so our bodies can optimally make the right amount of glutathione. Um, antioxidants, you know, vitamin C and quercetin, vitamin E, all the, you know, we could list off a, a number of them. Um, they're all good. Those are, those are considered exogenous, um, meaning they come from outside the body. We ingest them, they go in, and they do a similar type reaction we're going to talk about as well. Um, to help render these uh, these bad molecules um, harmless. So um, you're right. I think a lot of people uh, certainly have been told that well, you can swallow a lot of antioxidants, but there's some convincing literature that. Uh, you could swallow all the antioxidants in the world, and they probably aren't going to do a whole lot for you, and may, in fact, uh, be harmful. A lot of people still like to point to the old vitamin E study in smokers. Yeah. That, uh, you know, vitamin E consumption worsened lung cancer, um, and we can go down. That. Remember yeah. that study? Yep. Yep. And that vitamin C in excessive doses can turn into a pro-oxidant rather than an antioxidant. But you're right, glutathione, we make ourselves. Um, and in a little bit, we're going to talk about swallowing glutathione. And uh, yeah. So what's the secret to glutathione? I mean, how does it work? How does it mop up free radicals or neutralize them? 
Well, it, you know what? It comes down to one simple thing, and and honestly, it's 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 it really is this simple: sulfur. Um, glutathione has what is called a sulfhydro group. All that means is it's a fancy term for the fact that it has a sulfur atom attached to the molecule that has a hydrogen atom attached to that sulfur. And that sulfur readily wants to give up its hydrogen or electron to neutralize these free radicals, if that makes sense. And and that's 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 the secret behind glutathione. That's how it works. Uh, sulfur, it is uh, it's that yellow stuff. And isn't that uh, the stuff that makes rotten eggs smell like rotten eggs? <laughs> exactly. If you've ever been to Yellowstone, uh, you'll 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 be very familiar with that. Um, yeah. And and you know you, you smell that and you think, well, how can that be good for my body? It's it's vital. For your body in many ways and, and i don't just mean you know for antioxidants um uh sulfur is is used uh to to make many of the building blocks uh of all the tissues of our body um uh, it is used in our immune system um it's it's essential and so yeah we we have to we have to get an adequate amount of, of sulfur to be able to make glutathione yeah, I think uh, I think it's fascinating that uh, many Star Trek fans uh, know <laughs> that we're a carbon-based life form. Yep. Uh, but it's perfectly conceivable, and many people would argue that we're also a sulfur-based life form. Absolutely. And, uh, I think we probably forget that at, at our peril. Um, like you're pointing out, sulfur is right behind. Copper is probably what we need most out of the uh, elemental table. You're right. Absolutely right. Yeah. I mean, it, I think the, the general public would be, be surprised if they knew the types of, types of metals and different things in our bodies that catalyze the reactions that make us, make us move and alive every day. Uh, chromium, for instance. Yeah. Sel selenium. Um, gold, silver, I mean, all of these are utilized in the body to catalyze reactions. Okay, so t you're talking about reactions and sulfation, and, and people have, you know, heard, I'm sure they've heard about sulfur. Uh, some people are aware of sulfites, uh, some of the things we use to keep wine from going bad. Uh, what's, what's the difference and why is sulfur different than sulfites and should we be worried about all these different forms of sulfur? Very good question. So um, you, you'll hear two, two words commonly now and they're demonized. It's sulfites and sulfates. Switch the I for an A. Uh, sulfates, uh, the only difference between a sulfate and a sulfite molecule is that a sulfate has four oxygen atoms attached to a sulfur and a sulfite has three oxygen atoms and like you said we use them as preservatives frequently in foods um, personal care products many of the surfactants you know soap a long time ago used to not foam um, it foams now because we use sulfates and sulfites um, the the problem th those two ingredients actually are not bad for you they're not carcinogenic, they, but there are individuals who are sensitive and some individuals who are actually allergic to them. Um, and so it's, it's sulfite and sulfate are actual molecules containing sulfur. Sulfur is a completely separate thing. You, you need sulfur to live. Your body's made of it. So they're two completely and, – and along that line as well, you know, there are people who have you know, allergies to sulfa drugs. Right. Um, trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole is one of them. Um, and, you know, that once again, that has nothing to do with the sulfur atom. It's the actual drug. Gotcha. Yep. So, so, sul so sulfur uh, is very important in sulfation and uh, its role in phase one and phase two detoxification in the liver. Can you, can you walk us through that? Yes, I can, absolutely. Um, 
I really wish I could uh, show this picture, but basically, uh, in the liver, the body, well, the body has two, um, let me see if I can bring you, bring you back up here. The body has um, two ways that it uh, detoxifies or naturally gets rid of toxins, okay? So everything that we ingest um, passes through the liver, the liver uh, liver and kidneys for that matter. And those, those two organs are, are, are basically filters. Um, phase, phase one uh, detoxification um, utilizes an enzyme called cytochrome P450, or they just abbreviate it CYP450. CYP um, these enzymes, uh, they do kind of a quick and dirty way of getting rid of stuff. Uh, they either oxidize the free radical, reduce it, uh, or they uh, hydrolyze it by putting hydrogen atoms on it, which renders it inert, uh, or they dehalogenate it. And what that means is, is halogens are specific atoms, uh, like chlorine, for instance, is a halogen, argon, some of the other uh, you know, elements in the periodic table. Um, they remove those, these enzymes do, and it makes the free radical, once again, inert or harmless. Um, and those are typically the fat, like fat-soluble toxins, okay? Uh, things that are, that are fatty in nature. Water-soluble toxins that we, we ingest or we're exposed to, um, those uh, go through a conjugation pathway. Um, and what that means is, um, is, you know, in the case of glutathione, uh, glutathione attaches itself to that toxin. And by doing so, once again, makes it harmless. And then the body simply passes it out to the kidneys and into the urine. But the, 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 key, the key point here is, is that glutathione is, is utilized in both phase one and phase two detoxification in the liver. Hence why, another reason why it's called the master antioxidant. And so, so just to kind of follow up with that, so if glutathione attaches to a water-soluble toxin mm -hmm. and it's then excreted in the urine, uh, what you're saying is we got to make more glutathione because we're constantly losing it. Y yeah, in, to a degree. Yes, um, we, we are. And, and our bodies normally are, are able to do that just, just fine. Um, but with time, age, you know, uh, exposure to, to, to toxins, um, uh, chronic disease, diabetes, cancer, heart disease, hypertension, a lot of the things we're seeing in you know, the Western world, more and more autoimmune disorders, um, the body becomes less efficient at not only producing new glutathione, but it becomes less efficient at recycling it. And we'll talk more about that too. Well, that's probably a, you know, that's a good jumping off part. How do we, you know, recycle glutathione? Yeah, good, good question. So, um, glutathione, once it's, um, it's primary, primary way that it works is it readily donates, like I said, this, this, uh, electron or hydrogen atom to the free radical and makes it so it feels complete. So it's complete and it doesn't go around scavenging because normally free radicals, what they do is, like I said, they're unstable. They, they, they will pull an electron or hydrogen atom from wherever they can get it. And unfortunately, if it's from DNA, you're going to have damage to your DNA. Uh, if it's from uh, anything inside the cell, you're going to have damage to the cell. Um, and that's why they're so bad. So once you make this free radical whole, it no longer wants to go around pulling things off and make, you know, making a, a muck of things basically, basically. So, um, the, uh, when, when glutathione donates its hydrogen, it then binds to another glutathione that has also donated its hydrogen. Okay. 
um, and it makes what's called glutathione disulfide. And we abbreviated it instead of GSH, because the hydrogen's gone, we abbreviate it GSSH. Okay? And so that's also floating around in our bodies. Um, but we have an innate mechanism to recycle this. There's an enzyme called glutathione uh, reductase. And what it does is it takes that GSSH, it's useless, and adds a hydrogen and an elect electron and a hydrogen to each one of them and creates two brand new G uh, glutathione molecules. So, so why, if that happens in a, as a natural process, uh, why are so many of us deficient in glutathione? Very good question as well. I, there's, there's a couple couple of reasons. Um, one, we talked about a little bit, touched on low, low sulfate intake in our diets. Um, I don't think, I mean, I, I, you know, people are more health conscious today. Um, uh, but, you know, some of the foods that you probably ought to look at, you know, eating more and ingesting that are higher in sulfur, um, meats, so turkey, beef, chicken, um, fish, um, it, you know, for more uh, the vegan route, uh, plants uh, such as, um, you know, seeds, grains, legumes, uh, nuts, walnuts in particular are high in sulfur. Um, chickpeas, couscous, eggs, obviously, are high in sulfur. Um Allium vegetables, and that's a class of vegetables. And you're, you're going to be like, well, yeah, they'll smell, they'll have kind of a pungent aroma. And the reason why is because they're high in sulfur, and that's onion, garlic, leeks, um, uh, scallions, uh, shallots. Shallot, um, yeah. all, of, all of those types of vegetables are very, very high in sulfur. Um, and then there's the cruciferous vegetables. Um, that uh, most of us are, are exposed to and, and eat, and that's broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage. If you ever notice these vegetables that I'm listing off here, you put them in the fridge or you cook, you cook them and then put them in the fridge, and then you get them out. If you open up the container, you can smell the, the sulfur. You can, you can actually smell it in, in, in the product. Um, arugula is another one, kale. Um, and radish, believe it or not, is also high in sulfur. So, you know, looking at all these and, and trying to include them more in your diet, um, that's one reason why we're deficient, or, you know, in glutathione. Um, the other one is kind of a hard one to tackle, and that's environmental toxins. Uh, you know, there's only so much you can con control. We live in a world, we live in the world that we live in, you know, and, um, you know, recently with COVID and, and wearing masks and personal protective equipment, we've been more conscious of that. But the truth of the matter is you're going to be exposed to environmental toxins. It's just, it's unavoidable. Um, things to mitigate that, obviously, are, you know, um, staying away from things that you know are, are harmful. Cigarettes, alcohol, uh, um, you know, uh, where you live. There's only so much you can control there, too. If you live by a refinery, I, I mean, you know, I, those are things that are kind of out of out of our control. So that one's kind of a hard one. And I tend to kind of steer away from that because we really can't control certain things. Um, the third one, and, and this is a really big one, especially, is is gut health. Yeah, um, Dr. Gunder, you're very familiar with this. The, the human microbiome, which is basically the, the bacteria in the intestinal tract, um, out, outnumbers the cells in our body. Uh, it's, like, it's like 10 to 1. It, 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 it's literally an, an, an organ in and of itself. The intestinal tract has its own nervous system. It, um, and the bacteria, the good bacteria, um, produce certain things, uh, molecules that uh, benefit our body. Um, when we get dysbiosis, which is a fancy term for, you know, uh, more bad bacteria versus the good, and that can happen with, you know, chronic antibiotic use, poor diet, you name it. Um, 
we get a disbalance. And really, it, it's it, it, there needs to be a balance of good and bad bacteria. Um, leafy green vegetables contain high amounts of biotin. Um, that biotin is then converted to fat, free fatty acids, which are good for us. Um, and that is done by the bacteria in our intestinal tract. Uh, the intestinal microbes also produce biotin and other key elements that um, modulate the immune system and uh, help with glutathione uh, production. Yeah, I think uh, the, the intestinal microbiome, which has you know, been my area of interest now for 20 years, yeah. uh, these guys, there are sulfur-loving bacteria. And uh, one of the things that uh, when I was writing in The Energy Paradox that surprises many people is we've always been taught as, as physicians that hydrogen sulfide, which is you know, the rotten egg smell, is a toxic gas. Yep. And uh, in fact, um, it follows a hormetic curve. Uh, hydrogen sulfide is actually one of the most important what are now called postbiotic gases there are. And hydrogen sulfide is really critical for uh, gut communication to our uh, mitochondria, to our brain. And there's even some really cool evidence that hydrogen sulfide is very important in preventing atherosclerosis. So uh, we've kind of ignored uh, the contribution of the, of the microbiome and getting back to your subject sulfur uh, for too long. All right, I so agree. so glutathione. So if it's you know if it's the mother of all antioxidants, how come most people have have never heard of it? Yeah, that's I I uh, I've thought about that. I, I think there's probably multiple reasons, but I think two of the biggest ones. The first one is um, a, a straight out. COVID-19, um, people have become enamored, and they should be, more aware, more educated in immune health. And by doing so, you know, um, people are, are seeing more glutathione products in the market. Uh, uh, it's being talked about more. Um, um, so I, 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 I feel that that's, that's definitely part of it. Um, also, you know, we've got more, we have more than ever, uh, um, patients, you know, or, or people, uh, here, especially in the Western world, uh, with, uh, type two, type two diabetes, um, which is a, which is an inflammatory disorder, um, heart disease, which you're obviously an expert in, um, as well as there's been just an enormous surge in people with autoimmune disorders. And so I think, you know, with people getting more educated, getting online, reading more, they're seeing there's a common link between all that, and it's it, glutathione is that molecule. Um, I think the second reason is really that you know, um, you know, th this is something that's been taught. I, I mean, in medical school and in medicine for forever. Um, it's uh, it's just starting. To get out there now and i think it's just just a matter of uh, it's just timing honestly so i'm glad i'm glad people are becoming more educated it's a good thing well okay so it sounds like we ought to be getting more glutathione and i'm sure a lot of uh, my listeners can go to the health food store and they may see an entire row of glutathione or glutathione products, there's pure glutathione, there's NAC and acetylcysteine, and we might touch on the FDA controversy with that. There's liposomal glutathione, and then there's NACET, which you're going to talk about. But okay, so there's this whole vast array. And then when you start reading about glutathione, so many times you see well, you could, don't waste your money. Uh, glutathione will be broken down and it won't be absorbed and you're just throwing your money away. Uh, help us out here. Okay, let's do it. So, yes, to a degree, um, taking straight up glutathione, the majority of it uh, is lost in what's called the first pass effect. Um, and what the first pass effect uh, is basically 
But when you ingest something, like I said, it goes in your stomach and then it passes through your liver. Your liver breaks down a lot of a lot of things. It just it doesn't pack or the acid in the stomach or the enzymes, the, the, the digestive enzymes will break it down. So there's a term we use called bioavailability. That's just a fancy term for when you ingest something, how much of that are you actually getting and how much of it is actually being used for what you're taking it for. And so when you take straight up pure glutathione, it has a very low bioavailability. Um, in the hospital, when we have patients come in that have overdosed on Tylenol, um, the, uh, the, the main problem is um, that they have depleted their glutathione stores. And the, the only treatment that we really have uh, to get glutathione or to increase glutathione in, in their bodies is to aerosolize NAC. And I, I could always tell when we were when we were treating somebody for talent overdose because on the second floor I could smell sulfur. Um, but they would they would do it that way. And, and that administration is a very good way to get the key element, which is cysteine we're gonna talk about, into the body um, because it bypasses that first pass effect. It goes into the lungs and straight into the bloodstream. Um, but ingesting just straight up NAC, N-acetylcysteine, which is what the majority of glutathione products on the market utilize, uh, you're only getting about 10% or less. The, its bioavailability is very low as well. Is it still a good product to take? Sure, but it, it's not near, near as effective um, as what we're gonna talk about in a minute. The other one is liposomal glutathione. And, and basically that's, you know, glutathione that's been encapsulated uh, basically in uh, fatty acids that protect it to allow it to you know get through the digestive tract with enough time to be able to be available there's a problem with that though the body um, has a built-in has several well more than several um, hundreds of um, things called um, uh, feedback inhibitory mechanisms. What that means is the body knows how much it needs of a certain thing. Believe it or not, there is such a thing of having too much of a good thing. Um, so when the body senses that it's got enough glutathione, it sends a messenger back up and tells the body to shut off the production of glutathione. Okay, it's a default mechanism. It saves us because um, with too much glutathione, um, which liposomal glutathione can do, give you too much glutathione, you enter what's called a hyperreductive state. Okay, so we're talking about a hyperoxidative state. You know, we need to get rid of oxidation. We gotta, but being too reduced is also not good as well. And that's why NACIT is so phenomenal. NACIT is basically N-acetylcysteine, but it has two other chemical groups attached to it, an ethyl and an ester group. Um, they're just fancy terms for a couple other atoms. Uh, the ethyl and the ester group allow NACIT to be up to 68% bioavailable to the human body. Six times the amount the NAC is. Not only that, it doesn't bypass the natural feedback inhibitory mechanisms in the body. And even more, it readily crosses the protective blood brain barrier that all of us have. Um, that protects the brain from toxins and different things. Um, NAC and, and cysteine and other things, they don't pass through. This does, this actually enters the brain. And they've done studies uh, shown, shown, that have shown that um, uh, supplementation with NACIT, um, it, there are high amounts afterwards in the heart, liver, brain, testes, and other vital organs um, that, that are, required for life 
So can you, uh, I'm, I'll, I'll be willing to bet that a lot of people have heard of NAC, uh, particularly after uh, NAC uh, supplements disappeared from Amazon, yeah. after the FDA's announcement that NAC had been declared a drug in the 1930s, and it can't be a supplement. Uh, and, and yet, um, people should not be scared, number one, of NAC. But I'll bet you no one has looked up uh, NASET. Uh, where the heck do you find it? Well, um, I, I, I'm a bit of a nerd. Um, I, uh, <laughs> I I like to research a lot, and I spend a lot of time on PubMed and talking to other colleagues and, and just you know uh, delving into the textbooks and different things and 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 trying to figure out like you know there's got to be a way we can get we can get more cysteine, which is the rate limiting factor. Cysteine is an amino acid. We'll talk about that. Um, there's got to be a way to get more cysteine in our bodies orally um, without it breaking down. And um, I stumbled across NASIT. Um, it wasn't at the time, you know, being marketed at, at all for anything regarding glutathione. Um, but, you know, through research and looking at it more and more, I was able to see its potential, great potential for glutathione production. Um, and it's, it's uh, you know, the blood brain barrier and the fact that it doesn't, you know, bypass these, these natural things that save us, our bodies, and our bodies, I, I, huge potential. And so you have, in fact, a, a supplement that, that contains this, right? Yes, yes we do. It's, uh, we, uh, we call it GSH plus. Um, GSH is basically a, is a, a, an acronym abbreviation for glutathione. The G stands for glutathione, the S stands for sulfur, and the H stands for that electron or hydrogen that it donates. So if you don't smell sulfur in your product at least a little bit, you know you don't have the real thing. Ah, good um, point. So that's that's one thing I tell people. You know, if you get a glutathione product and it doesn't smell a little bad, you're you're not getting the right stuff. Now, um, our our formula contains a lot of other ingredients, uh, but before I, I get into that, I I, I want to just touch on a couple of things, and and uh, one of them is um, the the key, and I I've said this a couple of times, but the key rate limiting factor. So. If you think about, um, you got a you got an automobile, and you know it's uh, the engine works great, the, the the electronics are fine, the battery's fine, but there's no no fuel to put into it. it it's useless. Um, the engine that makes glutathione, it's gasoline, it's major component, the thing that can slow the production of glutathione down is cysteine. And like I said, it's an amino acid. Um, you can take cysteine, but once again, your body breaks it down and you don't absorb a lot of it. So this is, NASA is a way to get a cysteine donor is what it's called. It basically turns into cysteine once it gets into the body, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So... And, and we've also included um, uh, two other key ingredients, uh, glutamine, which is a, another ingredient that is um, in this machine, this engine that, that makes glutathione. Um, and then um, glycine, that's the third one, that's another amino acid. So there's basically three of them that are utilized in the production of glutathione. And we have all three of those plus a plethora of other ingredients we can talk about. Yeah, you have uh, several ingredients that really help liver uh, detoxification, like milk thistle extract and yeah. quercetin. Uh, but in the interest of time, um, I know you've talked about too much. Your, your product eliminates that possibility that you can literally overdose on glutathione and have, have the opposite effect of what you're looking for. Yep, perfect. 
yeah, it, it, it eliminates that ability um, to enter a hyper-reductive state. And the best way to think about it is to think hyper-oxidation is bad. We can all kind of imagine that. Like too much oxidation is, is bad for you, any oxidation really. Too much reduction in the body, which is the opposite of oxidation, is bad as well. Yeah, I got it. Well, this is great stuff. Uh, any other exciting things you're working on that you want to tease our listeners with? Always working on stuff. Um, you uh, briefly, you, you spoke on mitochondria. I'm just going to say something very quickly about that. Mitochondria actually, as we age as well, they become leaky. They, they become the source of the worst free radicals that we're exposed to, believe it or not. Um, and hence why glutathione is even more important as we, as we age. Uh, we, we're working on uh, mitochondrial formulas as well. Um, I wanted to touch very briefly as well, just on NACIT again. Uh, you mentioned hydrogen sulfide. And yeah, we've been taught that it's this bad thing, but it's a key, it, it actually is a key cellular messenger in the body uh, that helps modulate or control inflammation so it doesn't go out of control. And it also helps with insulin resistance. And NACIT really is the only molecule that we know of that, that increases the production of hydrogen sulfide. So that's, that's, that's a big deal. No, it is a big deal. And, yeah. Uh, because, again, I think for too long, most people and even physicians have been fearful of hydrogen sulfide. And yeah. that, you know, oh my gosh, it'll kill us. Uh, but you're right. Uh, the research that uh, I talk about in the energy paradox, it's fascinating how important um, that chemical is uh, to yeah. our, our well being. So, yeah. All right. Well, it's, it, Dr. Morris, it's been a real pleasure having you on. Same. And I, it's been exciting for people to hear about glutathione. Where do people find out more about you and your research? Well, I, I would point them to, to the website, um, uh, trygshplus.com um, forward slash Gundry. All right. Well, uh, we'll keep everybody posted on glutathione and glutathione research. And please uh, check out Dr. Morris and his work. All right. Excellent. Th thanks very much. Pleasure Thank having you. you on the program. Same. Thank All you right. for having me. Appreciate it. Bye. Okay. It's time for our audience question. This question comes from Eola on YouTube who says, Hello, Dr. Gundry. Could you tell us, please, if the sprouts are good or bad for the gut? Thank you. Well, interestingly enough, um, there's actually a lot of research that I published in The Plant Paradox about uh, sprouts uh, have a very high lectin content, particularly when they're very small and just germinating. And uh, it was kind of a surprise to me, but uh, for instance, alfalfa sprouts, which uh, are one of the more toxic sprouts to eat, uh, is because of the very high lectin content. But once the sprout gets uh, beyond just the little thing coming out of the seed, then they're actually quite safe to eat. So if, for instance, you're, you're worried that your sunflower uh, sprouts that are two or three inches long uh, are dangerous, they're not. Uh, mung bean sprouts, for instance, are not dangerous. So it just depends. What you do, don't want to do is get the almost immediately sprouted thing. So, and I've said this over and over again, sprouted breads like Ezekiel, which are the min miniature immature sprouts, may be one of the most lectin-rich foods that you can possibly eat. And I've actually seen this in several of my patients who for some reason started eating sprouted bread, uh, particularly Ezekiel bread, and their uh, autoimmune diseases flared. And once we identified that culprit and got it out of their diet, uh, things quieted down. So great question. Okay, it's time for the review of the week. Matthew Blackman on YouTube says, thanks Dr. G, I love taking the time to watch your podcast. The Plant Paradox is a life changer for me. Great book and easy to read. 
I'm now on to the longevity paradox and I already have the energy paradox, so I'm chomping at the bit to get stuck into them. You put me on a life-changing journey and I am so grateful for you and your team. Well, thanks a lot, Matthew. You know, that's why I write these books. Uh, it's for you to get some information that you probably haven't had before. And uh, good for you for getting all the books because uh, each time I write a book, it's because I've discovered something that you've asked me about that I've learned from my patients. And it's, you know, exciting new knowledge, I think. And thank you, most of you, for thinking the same way to pass on. And so thank you for writing. And again, anyone who's listening or watching, please send us a review on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And who knows, I'll be reading your letter next and answering your question. So I'm Dr. Gundry, and I'm always looking out for you. We'll see you next week. Before you go, I just wanted to remind you that you can find the show on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Because I'm Dr. Gundry, and I'm always looking out for you. Mm -hmm.